Welcome back to another impactful night of the Impact Education Leadership. This is episode 75. I'm your host, ID34, I just run the third. Tonight's panelists are the lovely Miss Nina Taylor and Kendrick Bullock. The lovely Miss Nina Taylor, please say hello to the people. Hello, everyone. It's good to be back. Absolutely. And Mr. Kendrick Bullock, please say hello to the people. Hola to the people of the world. Thank you for allowing me to to be a part of your community. Right on, right on. Well, tonight's topic is catch it, challenge it, and change it. I was told by a great philosopher that wisdom is not taught, but it is caught. Many educators have discussed new ways of observational learning using the social learning theory model as a structure. Albert Bendora said, learning is a social cognitive process and new behaviors can be developed by observing their use by others. So what we know is that the social cognitive process takes time to make changes, much like resiliency. Master resiliency is another powerful approach that, that plays a vital role in the social learning theory through personal growth, maturity, success, and happiness. Social learning theory and master resiliency are both critical in the classroom and can help students reach their potential. These goals are met through attention, retention, reproduction, and motivation. Tonight, we will have a discussion on what effects the social cognitive theory have on resiliency so that we can teach our students to catch it, challenge it, and then change it. Our first guest tonight on the panel, Mr. Kendrick Bullock, please say hello to the people and tell the listening audience a little bit more about what you're doing today. Hello, beautiful people. Hey, uh, my name is again Kendrick Bullard with E. I uh, retired from the U.S. Army as an information technology director. Uh, I uh, also played in the NFL for about three years consecutively. I was told that I was not going to be an engineer and that I had to stay in school and finish school so that I can, uh, so that I can, uh, join the army. But I found a way to do both through getting outside the bounds of the things that we are told we can do. So in other words, when people told me I couldn't do it, I found a way to do it. But I also used the people power to make those things happen. Uh, as a retirement officer, as a retired officer, I actually focus on community uh, yeah, renewable energy programs to include solar systems. And I figure out creative ways to, to help both the communities and the uh, and the uh, the communities and the corporations in these communities uh, to be able to take trash and turn it into treasure. Well, we thank you again for joining us in this discussion tonight. Like I said in the beginning, we're going to be discussing how do we teach our students to catch it, challenge it, and change it. Uh, Mr. Bull, you are no stranger to those those words. Um, you played in the NFL. You had many challenges, not only playing in the NFL, but getting to the NFL. Not only you know, getting out of high school, but going to college and being successful and, and then joining the military and then being a officer, being not only a field officer, but a African-American officer. Um, throughout the years, historically, you did not see uh, men of color uh, rise to that rank of officer. Um, mostly they were non-commissioned officers, even in the Civil War. Uh, time frames. You you did not see officers until uh, you know the great Buffalo Soldiers. You did not see officers, uh, African American officers, and, until you know the um, Vietnam Civil War uh, and uh, World War II uh, eras. 
so there were so many uh, barriers. High, there were there were no low barriers to entry. There were high uh, barriers to entry uh, to become uh, an officer in the military. And so you're you're no stranger about um, resiliency. You're no stranger about uh, social uh, cognitive uh, uh, learning processes you know, to help you uh, develop. Uh, key behavior traits to be successful and to be resilient and to be able to bounce back uh, from trauma and just from difficult situations. And with that being said, my question for you tonight is how how does one keep children motivated through personal development, through maturity and through emotional through emotional behavior? Uh, when they are within environments that are are not so uh, positive, that's my question for you. Well, I do appreciate your questioning, but I do want to go back and say, uh, did every barrier was a building block? Every barrier that you named, uh, I redefined it as a building block. So if somebody said you couldn't study engineering. I found a creative way to get the right people in place to include the coaches in track and field and got them to help me pay for those education systems or pay for the educational system. I had beautiful people who stood in my way and helped me do what I wanted to do. Coach Dave Flanagan, who was one of the coaches, uh, told me that I was able to do everything. It was a... Uh, track coach at the University at, at Arkansas State. I uh, was playing football and I was running track. I qualified for the Olympic trials and I qualified for the draft after about three years. He knew I wanted to finish my engineering degree. The coaches asked me to, you know, to walk away that I was, you know, I was doing too much. They wanted me to focus on the things that were important to them on the football program. Brother Jay Flanagan, who was literally my father while I was in school, he was a coach there, gave me a choice. Uh, he actually allowed me to make the choice to come over to the engineering, come over to the program for track and field. Now, again, uh, I'm thinking these were barriers, but everything that happened to me was a reason. Everything that I saw that I assumed that might have been a barrier we're actually the building block to greatness. The greatness comes from ourselves. Don't let, he taught me not to be limited by my own progress. In other words, get up our, we gotta get out of our own way and figure out creative ways to think higher than, than just ourselves. But he also showed me by allowing me, you know, probably about two or three months of you know, he had already worked it out where I had a scholarship. Here I am three months worried about what I was going to do for a scholarship, and he had worked it out three months ago. Uh, this gentleman is a prime indicator of the things, the other things that continue to happen to me over, over my life and career. Again, it's really about being to know that you can do anything we want to do just, just by the word of mouth. Our word of mouth is more powerful than all the monies of the world. Matter of fact, our minds are more powerful than all the monies of the world. Everything can be attained uh, just by being to plant it out in your head. Uh, in the military, I thought that I was doing all these great things, and I not realized I was doing these great things because the ability to do active things were already planned out for me. They were enjoyments of my life. There's nothing wrong with money, but we also have to put a, we also have to understand that money comes maybe two to three years down the line. The passions push us to, to the agendas uh, to help people and help ourselves uh, collectively. And I say that I see this, say that with free thought. Uh, we all are in peril with the gifts to do great things. And that is a, that is a scientific and a spiritual fact.
You know, I heard a lot of passion in what you said tonight. I, I want to hone in on the building blocks. When you mentioned building blocks, I could see a, a brick building. I could see that that brick building has, I don't know how many uh, thousands or millions of, of bricks, uh, depending on the size, of course, of that building. But to construct a, a, a solid structure, a, a brick building, you have to not only place the bricks in the right position, but they also have to be cemented. But I believe when you have positive connections, those positive connections represent uh, the cement, um, which is a representation of not only cement, but love. And when, when, you, when you have the love, when you have the grace to give um, a, a person building blocks to success and whatever endeavor uh, that they want uh, to go into, whatever direction they want to go into, uh, then you become a key component of uh, the awakening of that young person's mind, right? And and you and you may be able to give them three bricks, and someone else may be able to give them five bricks, someone else may be able to give them ten bricks, whatever measure uh, that you are pouring into. Uh, that person will be the end result, their success, uh, not overnight, but on down the road, three to five years uh, later. So it's important to catch them young, uh, is, is what I'm saying. Uh, you mentioned uh, Coach Flanagan, um, I believe, and uh, this man uh, is very sought after coach, uh, well known. Uh, he has the Midas touch. Uh, whoever he worked with went off to be successful, not only in uh, athletics, but in, in business, in every endeavor uh, that they um, pursued because of those positive connections, because of those, that, that positive reinforcement uh, of thinking, right? And so students have to be exposed. Uh, what I gained from you tonight is it is so crucial, it's so crucial for us to expose our students uh, to those positive connections and to those those building blocks, you know, and that uh, that's a perfect. I believe that's a perfect transition to um, the next guest uh, because she's going to talk a little bit more about that, more in depthly uh, about those uh, positive thinking um, components that we need to help raise uh, the next generation of of giants of. Um, of ambassadors, of leaders uh, in the United States, so and, and global leaders as well. So I want to thank you for adding um, so much, so much, so much value to this podcast. Uh, with that being said, uh, our next panelist is the lovely Miss Nina Taylor. Uh, Nina, please tell the listening audience who you are and uh, and what you're doing currently. And she just finished a new book too, but I'll let her tell you more. Okay. Uh, again, thank you for the invitation to be a part of the show tonight. Uh, again, I'm Nina Taylor. I'm a broadcaster, uh, a journalist, a photographer. I'm an author. Um, I'm a musician. I'm a songwriter. Um, I do quite a bit of things. We don't have time to go into it, but mostly uh, what I do on a daily basis is I um, produce a news segment that is played all over the world called the Gospel News. It's currently on around 2,000 stations or more around the world at this very moment. Um, also, I produce a show called the Gospel Express, which is also international as well. It's in about eight countries currently in about 65 stations here in the U.S. And I also am the host of a show that is exclusively for a station in London, England called Meet the Pastor, and I am the host of that show as well. Um, I also I have a Bachelor of Science in uh, Broadcast Communications and Psychology and a Master's in uh, Entertainment Business and Entertainment Law. Um, I'm just happy to be here tonight. Um, I thank you all for the opportunity. 
Well, I'm so excited. This is going to be a good mix, by the way. Uh, you know, our topic tonight is catch it, challenge it, change it. Okay? And so, Nina, you talk to some of everybody um, in the entertainment world and education world, you name it. Uh, how do you how do you get your children? Because I know you teach. I mean, you're an educator as well. But how do you how do you um, teach kids to transfer that negative energy, or how how do you teach kids to replace their negative thinking? That's it. Their negative thinking with positive thinking, positive thoughts, coherent statements. That's my question for you. Okay, I for the last 14 years I've been in the public school system. The last six years I've been what's called uh, an LLI instructor, which is stands for Learning Literacy Initiative, and I am the intermediate reading teacher. So when a child tests below average, when their test scores are below average, they're struggling, they can't do this, they're not keeping up with the flow of the rest of the children, then they become my student. Uh, each year I usually have about 20% of the entire uh, class body. If we have 66 kids, I normally have at least 20 of them, uh, which was the case last year, which is a lot. So quite a few of the children are struggling, uh, but what we've been taught, what we learn about what low social learning is, is that uh, kids are basically learning from the examples that they are given. So the way I reinforce it, and you can see that right away, you know, as soon as they come in, you can kind of get a idea of their background. Some of them, uh, my school is a special needs school. A lot of the kids are living in shelters. A lot of the kids are in foster homes. I would say 80% of them uh, are displaced. They're not with their mother and father, or they're with one parent or not the other. Or they're, like I said, in the foster care system, uh, we have them bust in from shelters from all over the city. Um, so with that in mind, uh, our way of teaching has to be a little bit different. They need nothing but positive reinforcements. You know, when they come in, we're always happy to see them. You know, hi, good morning, how are you? You know, we're asking about them. Not only uh, asking about, you know, have you eaten? We're making sure that they eat. They get uh, three meals while they're at school plus snacks. You know, a lot of them don't have a, a steady flow of food in the home where they are. Or certain times of the month, they're not eating at all. And they'll tell you, you know, they'll absolutely tell you. We have a program where kids are taking bags of food home uh, every Thursday, each kid gets, you know, uh, food and things like that. So we're trying to do what we can to help with their living situation. But while they're at school, and my thing, and this is why I'm so loved, and like, oh, the kids just love you, the kids just love you. But I always tell them just how great they are. You're great. You're better than what's going on in your life. You know, you can do anything that you want to do. And when they do something right or when they learn something, I am the happiest person on earth, and they know that. And that's what makes them really happy to come in my room. Some of them cry when they find out they can't come to my class that day because it, I try to make it such a good experience for them. And in the process of that, they're also learning. And I think the more positive the environment is for learning for the kids, the better that it is for them. Wow. You know, I'm not even trying to unpack all that. But what I got, what I got, what I pulled from that, what I hooked from that, what I caught from that was education healthy for the soul. Education is healthy for the soul. Education is healthy for the soul. I want to bring back on the um, for for this next question. I want to pull from Kendrick Bullard. But Nina, don't go anywhere because I want I'll, I'm gonna come back to you. I want to ask you another question. But I want to I want to pull from Mr. Bullard again. Uh, Mr. Bullard, I, I served with you in in the army. And there was a program by Dr. Karen Ravitch entitled The Master Resiliency. Now, the Army, the military, excuse me, the DOD purchased this program because the alarming spike of military suicides that we were experiencing during that time frame. Because, you know, we just got back from many deployments. 
uh, deployment after deployment to Afghanistan, Iraq, and uh, different other um, military uh, fronts as well, and throughout the different theaters uh, that we were deployed to. And so there, there was a heightened um, alert and a heightened risk on, on suicides and also domestic violence um, as well. Okay. So they instituted this program and they, I believe, gave, gave it to you to help head up at the brigade that we were stationed at during that time. So this question I want to ask you uh, is, is dealing with resiliency. So, um, Mr. Bullitt, what is the framework for developing a child's resiliency? What is the framework? What is the what is the approach? Where do you start? What what are the steps? How do you um, how do you approach? How do you introduce? How do you teach? How do you instruct? How do you guide a, a child in being resilient from trauma, from uh, things that don't go right? How do you how you teach a child how to bounce back? How you te- how you teach a child to have a growth mindset? How you teach a child and motivate a child that just because you know this didn't work this time, don't give up. That's my question for you. For me, it's about being able to listen. I remember all those times. First, let's, let's, let's start with what resiliency really is. Resiliency is compassion. It's love. It is a, a measure. Resiliency in the military is all about being able to manage people through the level of love and understanding that we have to be the lesson of ages. They gave me the program. And told me, and when I read it, for the first time I got a military officer, and I want to do, I want to teach love, I want to teach resiliency. You know, resiliency sounds hard, but it's really about being in to know uh, the people that you're dealing with on a right day to day basis and, and being able to apply what they said and let, listening with active compassion and being able to understand is that you may not be able to say anything once you leave that room, but the active listening was an important part of being able to get, reduce all the different suicide rates that we have to include the ones that, well, what's going on now. But again, this was back in 2014 to 15 when we were talking about resiliency, but it's about inducing change in people so that the toxic leadership is pushed out. I wouldn't recommend that for kids because kids have the ability to follow their own lead. Sometimes when you push a kid one way, they may go the other direction. I was one of those people. Now, that we had people who we pushed on the resiliency side in different directions, and uh, they went the way I asked them to push, asked them to go. And that's a good thing. As a leader, it worked. But we don't know what all, what, what's always going to work. So the best thing we can do is love them until and listen enough. And without writing it down, try to you know use the big brain and the big heart at the same time to be able to empathize with everything that's taking place. You know, I, we have some soldiers who are, a, 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 I just say, homosexual without a name to mention. You know, we had so I had personal soldiers who, you know, you know, we had. A, bunch of beautiful activities taking place in everybody's lives. But the fact that I was able to actively listen, using resiliency, made me a more powerful leader. Uh, But the fact that I was able to understand that everybody had a, 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 a beautiful gift, but the gift of compassion, as leaders, we can put systems in place and make things better. But resiliency and compassion, uh, that, that, that was a true force multiplier because now you're not losing soldiers. Again, that was back in 2016, 14, 15, probably even 16. 
those numbers are probably just as high. Matter of fact, uh, I did look, I do remember seeing one third of every female uh, in combat zone during that time, and the number hadn't changed, of course. One third of every female during that time was having some, they, they were attacking combat. So, uh, probably you might remember this. There were meetings where I would have people, you know, I would tell people that uh, the best thing we could do is that instead of having a buddy system, we had a tri buddy system for the women and a buddy system for the girls. I'm sorry, buddy system for the guys and a tri buddy system for the women. Because if one out of three people were, were, were being attacked, one or three women were being attacked, and the statistics for men were just as high, but we never talked about that. And again, the numbers are, it's tragic, but the good thing is, you know, we had the ability to be able to guide people uh, through the, uh, I'm sorry, through the active listening, we had, through the active listening act techniques, we had the ability, you know, to navigate people through a broader, I mean, it's just like being able to, you know, push somebody out on a, uh, a lake or something in a boat or either in a paddle, you know, sitting on a oar. And if you sit there long enough, the ripple will bring them back. If you yell loud enough, the ripple's going to push them out. It's really about being able to ask what you want. Well, what do they want out of it? And allowing them to, to, to express their peace. I've had uh, I've had a number of soldiers tell me that they wanted to commit fratricide to several to do a oh fratricide I'm sorry for those of you who don't know military term fratricide fratricide is something that happens to soldiers uh, uh, that basically it's a uh, suicide and it's basically a suicide rate and a uh, uh, a, a kind of a murder rate in the military, basically. And that's what, so I had people who wanted to commit murder for some of the toxic leaders, but they came to talk to me about it. But I had been through enough training, both on the military side and with Frito-Lay and other companies that I had worked with, that I understand that if I didn't listen, you know, if I, oh, I'm sorry, that by listening, by, by listening actively, I was able to repair whatever was taking place in there when actually, well, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say repair, I was able to, to watch them repair the building blocks that they had actually thrown out and build those building blocks from scratch and or, you know, from the building blocks that we had in, in the room. Even though there were times that I did fall asleep, I do admit that. But active listening is a gift, it's a skill, and it's just a desire. Uh, but the act of listening for kids comes in. For me, it's about being able to know that every kid has the ability to go their direction, the direction that they want to go. And if they decide to change direction, it's okay. we got to get out of their way, though. Wow. 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 This is getting good. This is getting real good. As you were speaking, Mr. Bullard, <laughs> I I had to go and I had to, I had to go and open up this book that I had read a few years ago because what you said reminded me of an excerpt of this book. Now this book was written by a very powerful theologian, okay, and it's how the name of the book is called "How to Develop Your Spirit Nature," and I think it's by Kenneth Hagin. By the way, in this book, he says, I'm going to read just one line. He said here in this book, science has spent millions of dollars to develop the physical body of man. Additionally, millions have been spent developing man's intellectual processes, which are a part of his soul. But we know so little and have done so little about developing the spirit of man. When you were speaking... All I could think about was resiliency has a lot to do with the spirit of a man and of a woman. Now, this book was written 
over 50 years ago, but it's, it's still relevant. No, yeah, over 50, between, between 50 and 70 years ago is when he wrote this book. But this book is still relevant today. It is still relevant today, which you said lines up to what this book says as well. And uh, for those of you that are not military, um, Mr. Bill also mentioned a term called tri-buddy system. That's another word for support system, uh, a three-member support system. But uh, when people listen to this podcast, I, I, you know, I really I recommend you to rewind and play back uh, certain parts of this podcast because these these podcasts are are like vitamin vitamins are like vitamin C vitamin D three. <laughs> These podcasts are like vitamins uh, that we need uh, to move uh, beyond COVID-19, to be resilient uh, during this transition, during this uh, economic shift uh, that we're encountering now. We need as much positive reinforcements as we can get our hands on so that we can give these to our, our, our loved ones, our children, our students, uh, you name it. Uh, Mr. Bullet, thank you so much again. Don't go anywhere because uh, I want you to tell a story, a personal story about resiliency uh, after I come back to you. Um, but with that being said, the lovely Miss Nina Taylor, you know, Nina is like family to me. We joke all the time, and when we talk, it's like for hours, and we just, we argue, we, we cry, we laugh. <laughs> well, we just enjoy the love, right? Um, yes, but I was, and, and I respect her opinion so much. She doesn't even. I don't think she even knows. I don't even think you know how much I respect uh, what you say, um, and and what and what also um, you you do um, not only locally and statewide, but internationally. Uh, you have um, you, you just written this book, and you you made me read this book, but. <laughs> <laughs> and then you wanted me to give you a, an analysis. You wanted me to synthesize yeah, a this book. And <laughs> yes, I didn't know I was reading it for enjoyment, but I didn't know I was going to have to do a book report, okay, and be a part of your book your book fan club. But okay, you know when Nina tells me to do something, I just say yes, ma'am. <laughs> I'm, and as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm going to let you tell, uh, after I ask you this question, I'm going to let you tell the listening audience a little bit more about uh, your book and what uh, you're doing with that. But uh, for now, let me ask you this question here. Um, what roles does social learning theory play in behavior and in resiliency, in your opinion? Well, when you say resilient, when, what I see is resilient as the ability to overcome and the ability to bounce back. That's, that's, what, that's what I see. And that's what is happening with most of the children today, at least in the public school system here in my city. Um, kids imitate what they see. Uh, if you notice, especially at the age group that I work with, which is four to six, um, one does something, you have 10 more that will do the exact same thing. So what's happening at home, what's happening to them in their environment when they are away from school, they're going to imitate those things. So for the six and a half hours that we have them, uh, we try to put something new in there, put something positive in there, you know, the positive reinforcement. So it's important because they're going to imitate the behavior that they are around. I remember once, just a quick story, uh, one of my five-year-olds, this was like uh, maybe two years ago, he was telling me, you know, don't, he was, you know, acting up that day, so I said, I'm going to have to tell your dad, you know, he lived with his father. And he said, don't tell my dad, my dad's going to take my game, he's going to take this, he's going to do that, you know, it's going to be all bad, you know, don't, don't tell him. And I said, well, yeah, I have to, that's my job, and I think that you need to be, you know, handle at home because of this situation. So he begged me all day long, you know, please don't tell my dad, please don't tell my dad. And as soon as his father got there to pick him up, because they have to come and do a face-to-face -face pickup, um, I told him, 
And then he just sat there. He was really mad. He just looked at me the whole time. He didn't even look at his dad. He looked at me the whole time. And just before he walked out the door, he said, snitches get stitches. <laughs> and his father had no idea what that even meant. He was like, what does that even mean? I said, he must have seen that on TV or somebody else around here is saying it, you know, a, a five-year-old saying, t- worried about somebody snitching on him. And I just thought it was just so funny. And he said he had heard it on TV or something. And then his brother or somebody was saying it. So the things that they're saying on a daily basis, they, they're definitely bringing it to school and they're definitely uh, imitating it. You know, they see certain kids act a certain way. They're going to do it too. You know, so for the six and a half hours that they're with us, we try to just instill something different in their mind, something that they can take home, uh, try to be a completely, we try to complete uh, a positive environment daily, you know, so that when they go home, they feel good. And it's to the point now where a lot of kids don't want to go home. You know, their environment is so negative that they'd rather be at school <laughs> than at home. And a lot of them do cry. We have to drag them and put them on the school buses in the evening because they don't want to go home. So it's definitely social learning is definitely, uh, it's real and it's affecting, you know, not only just the kids but our society because everybody's learning negative things from other people. Everybody is reacting negative to things that are happening around them. So what do we do? Wow. I heard so much confirmation and what you mm-hmm. said tonight, just so much. And it, for me to, anal- uh, to do an analysis on it, <laughs> uh, for me to synthesize, combine what you said and what Mr. Um, Ken- Kendrick Bullard said, for me, I, the, one, the one term I can come up with was value systems. Value systems. We have to reinforce that a, a positive value system. We have to do it through uh, one one-to-one mentoring. We have to do it through uh, FaceTime. Uh, we have to do it with uh, uh, the parents' guidance, with the parents' involvement for those that are in education. We have to do it for those that are in sports through extracurricular activities like, you know, football, soccer, baseball games. We have to donate uh, our time, our money, our energy, our sweat, uh, to help with these building blocks. We got to help with these building blocks, uh, where? In the community. We have to help with these building blocks in the schools, in the churches, in the, uh, with the Boy Scouts, with the Girl Scouts, with the Big Brother, Big Sister Foundations, uh, with programming, with curriculum. And then we have to follow up. We have to follow up and we have to get people involved in the community. We have to get people involved in the community civically, like what police officers, like firemen, like sports figures, like musicians, uh, radio hosts, television hosts, right? <laughs> Podcast hosts. Absolutely. You know, not just, not, not just the wealthy people, uh, not just the influential people, but the people that can be there the people that can be consistent, the people that can be disciplined enough that when it comes to time for you to pull on them, then they are available. And not only are they available, but they are consistently available. And if they cannot be there, then they should be able to have someone to stand in their place, if that makes sense. So tonight, I believe master resiliency, I believe when you start talking about resiliency, you got to start adding in value systems, right? Because I believe value systems are so important for uh, the cognitive learning structure, for the social learning theory. Um, because again, Albert uh, Bandura said, learning is a social cognitive process, and new behaviors can be developed by observing uh, those of others. So when you observe positive reinforcement traits as a child that is developing still, then those become the building blocks. Oh, I, I like how this is tying in together. I love how this is tying in together. I, I feel like we just started. <laughs> is, it, is it just me? But I feel like we just started. Uh, but we're, all, we're, we're almost out of time. <laughs> 
Uh, but before we go, I want to do two things. I want to first, I want I want uh, Nina to tell the listeners about her book, and then I want to I want Mr. Bullet to share a personal story, uh, a deep story about resiliency uh, that you've experienced um, in your career or just in your life. Family member, someone connected to you, it doesn't matter. But Nina, please tell us a little bit more about your book. Okay. Um, my book, it's been out since um, the beginning of Black History Month 2021. It's called Second Chance, and it was written by myself along with my co-author, Lawrence Lee. Um, the book is primarily about a couple uh, who survived slavery and were separated during the Civil War and got back together. Uh, many, many years later, and we're able to get back together. Um, it's a beautiful book. It's about love. It's about family. It's about resilience, about being able to overcome regardless of our circumstances and uh, the, the main circumstance. And this book mainly came out of my curiosity with um, researching my family tree. You know, I'm a genealogist as well. Uh, I've researched my family back uh, seven generations to the exact moment where we were freed on both sides of my um, mom's family, on her dad's side and her mother's side. And just my curiosity about slavery and how they lived, uh, this book came out of that, basically, well, at least the beginning of it, is written in two parts. There's four main characters, um, and I think that you'll love it. It's, it's about love. It's about, you know, surviving because of and... Um, you know, it's it's one of those books that will leave you saying, what if, you know, what if that happened? I mean, what if it did happen? I mean, wow, that would be great, you know. Uh, and I think it has a, surprise, a lot of surprises in it that you wouldn't expect. I do have a wild imagination, which is what I've been told since I, you know, was a kid, that I have a wild imagination. So it's nothing like what you would expect. I mean, my mind just doesn't work like that. <laughs> just, it's nothing like what you would expect. It's not the typical love story. It's it's nothing typical about it. And um, uh, my brother will tell you, <laughs> it's full of a lot of surprises. But uh, I am a history buff, so it does have some historical content as well as just a great story about about love. So if you can, check it out. Um, the book is on Amazon. You have to put in the number two, second chance, and you do have to put both our names in because my name is on Amazon for many things, uh, mostly music. So you have to put my name as well as his name, which is Lawrence Lee, L-E-E, -E, just like Bruce Lee. So thank you for the opportunity to talk about the book. I appreciate it. Oh, no, I'm not going to let you all take easy. I'm about to say something here, and you're probably not going to like what I'm going to say. So when I bought okay. the book, and, and, you know, she shipped it to me right away, First off, uh -huh. I didn't get my autograph, okay? I did not get my autograph. It and came I directly from said, Amazon. That's why it didn't come from me. It came from Amazon. <laughs> okay, okay. And then I mm -hmm. read it. I read it in one day. I read it in, like, one day. And I called you to let you know. I thought you were going to be saying, oh, you read my book. And you was like, um, I need to do a full analysis of this book. I know <laughs> which you got this book. But no, when I, I enjoyed I enjoyed your book and um I mean when I picked it up I couldn't put it down but I, I was upset. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tell the listeners about your book, but it did mm -hmm. upset me several several times and how you concluded mm -hmm. certain things. I was I was a, I was I wanted to call you and, and say some things but I had to be a gentleman, so I had to refrain from that. <laughs> but great, great book. Go out and get it. Second Chance by Nina Taylor and Lawrence Lee. And with that being said, thank you for sharing your book with us. And uh, But personal story time. Mr. Bullet, please share. Quick story. Whatever the story comes out, know that uh, the moral to whatever... A uh, story that I pass off to you, the moral to the story will always be, be it is okay to be authentic. Uh, and I tell this quick story because while we were in the military, uh, there were a lot of things that were easy. Had I 
been in the military, had I told anybody exactly what had taken place, uh, what had taken place, it would have allowed me to, it, it would have forced me to go either go to jail or send somebody else to jail for no reason at all. Uh, there are a lot of different uh, regulations in the military pertaining to homosexual uh, soldiers. I had two soldiers that were in our unit. Uh, short story is, I got a secure call from one of our managers, first sergeant, and he told me that I need to come and get there right away. We were already dealing with an issue when we were uh, in the, uh, what they call the field environment. Uh, I'm trying to avoid all the military terminology, but just know that it was 4 o'clock in the morning. It took me about an hour to get uh, 15 minutes away because I had to drive what they call a, uh, a blackout drive, which is no lights whatsoever for 10 miles. And it's 45 minutes to get 10 miles, something like that. And uh, it was in the brush. You might remember, but you're definitely the guy going to know who this was. Again, the goal uh, the story is to ensure that we are authentic in who we are and be positive that that's what you want to do and if you don't want to do it, change it. So here's the story. We're in the woods. I get I get to my uh, location uh, in 45 minutes and we had two soldiers, two of our soldiers fighting. And my thought is, these are grown men, they wouldn't possibly wouldn't be fighting. Uh, so anyway, long story short, we had to send our, we had to go in the woods and talk because we had a bunch of different weapon systems that were in the area and they, they were basically uh, sniffers, they were microphones but that would spy on us. So we had to walk about a mile, in the, a quarter of a mile in the woods and sat there long enough so that I could ensure that I knew exactly what I was going to do and I had no idea what I was going to do. I had no idea what I was going to do because these two gentlemen who were in a relationship in the military were fighting. I didn't really understand what was going on, but the, the, the more to the story for me is about being a little good to know that the regulations in the military don't always point to the right direction. We have to be authentic enough to know that just because it's illegal doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. I was authentic in the moment because I knew that these were good people, individuals. I had known them for a long time. I promised that they wouldn't, I assured that they weren't gonna be fighting. I didn't even ask about the relationships that they had because I told them exactly what was gonna take place if they had told me the story. I immediately asked them if, after I told them the regulations on uh, homosexuality in the military, I immediately asked them if they wanted to tell me what was going on. And they immediately said yes. And they were arguing. And I said, I don't need to hear this story because I don't want either one of us to get in trouble. I don't care about me. I, I've been in the military. But it was a chance for me to be authentic and take a stand for the things, the beautiful and the pleasant things that matter in the world to people. If they wanted to have a relationship, if they didn't, they shouldn't have had the relationship out there on the field. They definitely shouldn't have been fighting. But can you believe what would have happened? These two guys, these two beautiful people would have gone to jail had I promoted reporter thing. And I just said, yeah, I just, and, I knew in my soul it was not the person who I was. And that's not the only time that that happened. But it's okay to be authentic. But the more you're authentic for who you are, uh, the more you're authentic both as a leader and as people, the easier it is to acquire the things that you want or don't want to do in this world. You know, don't let the barriers barricade you. Use them as blocks to build uh, your path to heaven. Uh, that's just several stories, one of the several stories they had. Again, I've had a number of stories like that happen on a regular basis, but allowing your kids, in this case, 
and allowing me to be authentic for what was happening with those gentlemen, which were taking my kids at the time, allowed all of us to grow instead of stifling the growth. If I was sent them to jail for no reason at all, I would have got demoted, whatever it may be, but I would have felt miserable for the rest of my life and maybe even more. Uh, I do believe in forgiveness, but I also believe that we don't have to ask for forgiveness that we can continue, you know, to do right by the people in the world. Again, learn to be authentic, and it's okay to allow your kids to be authentic, but when they are authentic, don't push them. Don't, don't hold them between, uh, uh, don't hold the kids when they, when your kid, when you allow your kids to be authentic, don't, don't, don't allow, don't, don't push them between two sets of rules that really don't make any sense for anybody. Love them through it, love yourself really through it, and understand that their perspective matters. That's going to be hard to beat. That, that story is going to be hard to beat. But um, Nina, you're next. <laughs> wow. <laughs> now, it's a personal story about resilience. Is that what you said? <laughs> Correct. Correct. Well, uh, well, over the past, over the past year since COVID hit, Ashley started in March. We've lost four family members. Um, one of my aunts was married 52 years to her husband. He became ill and he passed away last March. Um, it's like, I, I just kept looking at her like, you know, how do you, I can't even imagine them two not being together, you know? It's like, how do you pick up and just, you know, go on after losing someone who you've been with over half of your life and it's it's just been amazing how you know people can go on after something like this i mean it was hard of course and she still misses him and she still cries all the time and not all the time but you know she's making it you know and i just admire her for that it's like you know how do you, how do you do it and i'm trying to put myself in her situation, I was like, wow, that would be really, really very difficult, <laughs> you know? Can't even imagine it, you know? And, and even like my stepmom, she was married to my dad for a long, long time. Um, you know, how do people do it, you know? It's, it's, it's just hard for me to see and to imagine, uh, you know, what they are going through and how they just pick up and go on with their lives after something like this and it's been a, a few kids at my school also just just a quick story um one who lost both his parents and was uh living in a homeless shelter for quite some time and then he got into the foster care system and i think i believe that's where he is still now um but after everything he had went through and he lost his parents very terrible i mean you know in some kind of very uh, away and and I, I guess he saw it and even despite that he still comes to school with a smile on his face and everything he's been through he's been through a lot you know um, he still comes to school happy he's happy to be there he wants to learn he says he, you know his mom wanted him to go to school so he wants to go to school and he wants to be a doctor and you know you know he switches up every other week of what he wants to be but the thing is that you know even after everything he's been through and still going through being in you know bounced from foster home to foster home he still seems like he's happy you know and and i just find that amazing and you know we try to make you know all the kids you know school a great experience for each one of them but you know he just stands out in my mind as one who has been through you know, a lot and still going through things, but despite of that, he's doing great. You know, he's doing great with his grades and he's just getting along well. And, and I just admire him for that. 